Welcome to the Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today, we have a repeat guest who has done some amazing project. We've had them on the show before. They're doing the, they're servicing the world's heavy industries. Uh, they're dealing with the biggest machines, just a, a, full lineup of incredible projects they have under their belt. I'm talking about l h Industrial. We're going to have their mineral processing product line manager, Patrick Weaver on, and their digital business development manager, uh, Gage uh, Wandler on. Uh, Gage and Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. I'm going to start with you, Gage, uh, to just give us, it's been a while since l has actually been on the show. So can you give us that bird's eye view of who the company is. Yep. So l was a company founded in 1964 by my grandfather. Started out in the oil derricks, fixing pipe, fixing uh, oil machines. And then in the 1990s, we kind of switched into the coal industry and started helping the mining industry in the Thunder Basin. And then in the early 2000s, started divulging as just a machine slash manufacturing shop instead of specific industry. So we started getting into aerospace, did a NASA project, did a, a lot of government contracts, um, went still with a full foot into mining, into oil, the oil sands up in Canada, but uh, more of a performing leader for innovation, for legacy equipment and new equipment in the industry. So uh, just to clarify, I remember uh, we did the NASA project on the last time you were on. We'll, we have to put a link to that because it was pretty amazing. Um, but um, to clarify, you didn't, it, it was an expansion of the company's offerings and capabilities, not a pivot so much then. Yep, exactly. It was an expansion. So back in the 90s when the oil crash crash started happening we realized that we can't just solidify ourselves in one industry so we started expanding started getting more highly technical engineers and highly technical machines and started implementing them through our Gillette Wyoming facility and our our Tempe facility and we also have a Sheridan facility so there's a couple couple American based facilities around and then we have two in Mexico and one in Chile so we are global. We do have a global presence. Large manufacturing is what we would like, what we like to see. I'm saying large is over 500 pounds up to, and our Tempe, our new machine will be able to do 350 tons. Wow. So massive, massive components. And we will do smaller stuff, but highly technical is what we like. Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide. We are heading to events across North America, Africa, and Australia, and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of our Crownsman's Heavy Industry World Tour. When you see the orange iron of a ditch witch machine out in the field, you can be sure of one thing. A job is getting done. As the leading manufacturer of underground construction equipment, Ditch Witch has been a catalyst of innovation for the industry since the day they were founded. And with a worldwide and world-class dealership network that features over 175 dealerships across the globe, this equipment is backed by the best. Learn more at ditchwitch.com. With Fender Dunlop, you know you are getting the best conveyor belting in the market. That's because they ensure the integrity of their conveyor belting by monitoring each step of the manufacturing process in their North American facilities. Focused attention is given to each belting order to guarantee that they produce a belt that will assist the customer in reducing operation costs, maximizing uptime, and improving revenue. Visit FenderDunlopAmericas.com to learn more. Where do you... So maybe if you could just give us a couple of examples of where you'd step in, like within a customer's operation, um, where, where do you, like you mentioned, drag lines and operations like that. So where are you stepping in? Is, is it when there's not sort of a manufactured, a standard manufactured product um, available to them? It's all over and it depends on what industry you're talking about. So if you're talking about government, we're at the floor level helping them develop um, you could say some nuclear reactor components, some DOD components. Uh, so that, that is, you're not the OEM because you didn't engineer it, but you're helping them develop the first product. Mm, I see. We go all the way back in coal. 
if a customer starts not supporting that component anymore, that building of that manufacturing of that component, we I will see. take over that aspect and we'll, if that component started failing early on and the OEM doesn't want to take responsibility for it failing, we will actually uh, upgrade it and evolve it into a longer lasting component. And we have a lot of case studies on perfecting and helping out the customer in a horrible scenario. I, I feel like that just that topic alone could be an entire show, but, um, but in the, <laughs> it, it, with, with time in mind, um, I'm going to jump over to you, Patrick. Um, Gage uh, mentioned keeping, uh, keeping you interested. Does Ellen Dage do that for you? They do. They, <laughs> they, they keep you pretty busy. <laughs> Um, let's, I want to talk a little bit specifically on the aggregate side. Can you walk us through sort of the different stages of aggregate and where L and H would step in or could step in? Well, well, we'll kind of get back into where we, how we got into aggregate. Um, really what drove that was when we got into mineral processing back around 2010, 2011, we needed to drive more revenue into our Tempe, Arizona facility. Um, to do that, we made a pivot towards the mineral processing side of things, that being everything, pretty much all processing after it leaves a haul truck, if you will. We did that on the mining side, which pushed us into mills, into crushers, um, conveying screens, apron feeders, you know, that type of equipment. And we did that pretty, pretty heavy for the better part of seven, eight years as mineral processing was coming up the curve and growing. In 2019, we made a shift. Um, we always kind of looked at the aggregate industry and, and kind of thought it might be a good fit for us, but we didn't really have a presence in it. I mean, we did, obviously we worked on crushers and we worked on equipment, a lot of the, the equipment that aggregate uses, but we weren't an aggregate supplier per se. Uh, in 2019, we did an acquisition of a company called Innotech um, and they had a very large customer base, probably 200 plus customers. And 95% of those customers were all aggregate based customers. So that really thrust us into the aggregate market. Um, when we originally did that, we wanted the technology around improving legacy crushers and machines, but it also was a thought through process of how do we get into the aggregate? What do we have to offer them? Once we, did the acquisition, started getting ourselves out in the marketplace, we found that we actually were a very good fit for the aggregate side of, of mining um, because we had so much more to offer than just we can come in and upgrade your legacy machine, but because of our large facilities and our large machining and welding and all of our capabilities that we brought to the table, we really became a, a one-stop shop for a lot of these aggregate sites to where they could call us and say, hey, you know, I need this part or I need this improved. Oh, do you have guys to, that can fix this on site? Yes, we do. Do you have guys that can install this? Yes, we do. So we've really moved very quickly into that space and it's been a very good fit for us. It's really been growing since 2019. It's become the largest piece of the mineral processing product line. So in a matter of three, four years, it, it became the largest part of our mineral processing offerings. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we went down to Con Expo and I, I really opened my eyes to, you know, I've been in the energy space, the mining space, and just that specifically that aggregate space, what it feeds, because it sort of feeds every industry, just, well, not sort of, it does, it's all part of it. So it, 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 I could see how it would have that amazing opportunity. Um, you, you mentioned, you both sort of mentioned the legacy equipment. I just want to get a, like... Actually, we were going originally when we were doing do this show, uh, we were going to try to time it so that there'd be a project in the background. Um, I, I think it was a, a couple of big cone crushers um, that were going to be behind you, but just timing didn't quite work out. So what would be an example, though, if it's um, a, a cone crusher, or a jaw crusher and, and some sort of I, I'm, I'm sort of picturing uh, maybe uh, an aggregate space it's been around for 30 years and and now they're trying to upgrade is that sort of what we're talking about here correct it's um most of your when we say legacy equipment most of it is 20 plus years old um one of them uh, probably most well known is simon's 
and that brand has been around. It was actually one of the first cone crushers ever designed. So it's been yeah. a 120 year old design that hasn't shockingly changed a whole lot over the years. Um, but that crusher was never designed with a lot of the, the safety things in mind because it was built at a time where it was all about production and, you know, they didn't really think through some of that stuff like we do now. Right. So we were able to come in and add uh, tramp relief systems, better lube systems, um, better monitoring items that really not only increase production, but increase safety. So it's kind of a win-win on both sides of that fence. Right. And from the operate, from the operator standpoint, they're not having to go out and of course buy a brand new crusher that for one time I'm assuming lead, well, I'm not assuming I know, I know lead times on some of these new units right now, if we wanted to get into supply chains and all those types of things, I mean, they could be waiting months and months for a new operation. Never mind the fact of that expense of the capital they'd have to put out to get a new unit. So that's sort of where you find that sweet spot then. Yes, it is. It's actually what we look for is okay. You know, we, we work hand in hand with our customers and we try to find what is it that, you know, keeps you up at night, if you will. Mm. And then we try to target those areas through engineering, through innovation. Can we make it better? Can we make it better? And can we do it cost effectively enough to make them want to do that? So that's really the sweet spot you're looking for. And if you can improve both production and safety at the same time and do it at a cost effective price, then that's you know, that's a, a niche that's pretty easy to sell. OptiSize is a leading edge geophysical acquisition design and software company. OptiSize provides innovative seismic survey designs utilizing the latest field technology and optimizing for advanced processing and quantitative interpretation techniques. OptiSize's mission is to bring sustainable exploration solutions to energy development with their custom land footprint reduction technology. EcoSize. EcoSize enables operators to focus on reducing their environmental and greenhouse gas footprint while imaging all their subsurface targets and reducing costs. You can visit them at OptiSize.com to learn more. Dayquip specializes in the design and manufacturing of attachments for all makes and models of compact excavators, wheel loaders, crawl do dozers, and articulated dump trucks. You can choose from any of their engineered attachments, or they can design and build to your specifications. All of their products can be shipped anywhere in North America, hassle-free. If you don't see it, just ask and they will build it. Check out their website, www.dayquip.com, or email them, info at dayquip.com, for sales, quotes, and support. PowerZone carries a massive inventory of pumps, engines, generators, and compressors. However, they don't stop there. They combine imagination with world-class engineering. They detail the entire process to every customer. Their pump package testing facility ensures your equipment is landing on-site, ready to work. That is PowerZone. Start with inventory. Develop with imagination. Deliver with integrity. And it's all at PowerZone.com. That is PowerZone. The, um, the, we're doing so many, this is especially on the mining side where there's some bleed into aggregate and that, um, we're seeing it a bit, a lot on the construction side, the monitoring has just ratcheted it up to, uh, I mean, it's, it's exploded into an industry. It's, it's like every second show now is talking about it and each monitoring system is, is different and fills a different need and provides a different set of data that's required and, now you've got things like government regulations coming in that have required certain uh, processes in place, including data. It's, it's just a lot. Um, so have you moved into that space, space, Gage? Yeah. So now you're speaking my language. This has been my life for uh, more than more than a year, but specifically eight months ago, I took the role of digital business development manager with the goal of we had this idea to create our own monitoring system specifically at this at that time was for power units so some, a component we already sold that needed monitored and the analog wasn't working the gauge would break something would happen and nobody would really know until something something happened so we started with this idea that we are going to monitor power units for aggregate i envision in the next few years this will be the go to there's already some OEMs that are implementing these on new machines um, and the bad part about doing that is you leave the old machines 
to, to, to go get thrown away because people start falling in love with this digital monitoring and the ease of access. And I've, I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I've wondered about this and asked about it on the show. Usually I get the answer from the OEMs. They go, well, we're just putting it on our new machines. Um, there's a little bit the heavy equipment manufacturer, like the, the you know, the cats of the world is that there. There's some retrofitting, I think, um, but I'm getting a lot of, well, it's on the new machines. And so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I've been wanting, I've been actually waiting for this on the show for a while. So this is actually retrofitting these old machines with modern monitoring systems. Either way, yes. Uh, we just developed a new box uh, that can take 150 inputs. So 150 sensors can be placed into one connectivity box, is what we're calling it. And it can go up into the cloud and get dispersed. So it's very easy. Any other industry, if you've got, um, if you have anything you want to measure, I, measure, I can't preference it enough. If you have a component that the new OEM is not monitoring or you don't like their system or you want to keep all your fleet, say you're an aggregate supplier, any supplier, and you want to keep your, your haul trucks on the same IoT device as your uh, crushers and your any, anything. We, we can be that source and we, can, we have that power to throw anything into the cloud and give you one database, one app, one website to monitor everything, everything on your site. I want to just touch on just the innovation because it seems like a company like yours could probably lock in um, to, to certain industries. There'd be some ups and downs, but you'd be able to maintain it. But there seems to be a pretty steady push to always expand, look at new industries, look at new technology, um, and, and now some companies are in a position where it seems like they would have to because things are changing so fast. The competitor's coming in. And I mean, you, you have to adapt. Um, but in your case, it seems like you almost could make the argument. You could just service this sector. But where do you think that that innovative sort of uh, spirit or DNA or, or whatever that is, um, is sort of woven? And because I saw I'm seeing it in this interview and I saw it on the last interview um, that we did with l &H. Yeah. So it's l and H's philosophy, which is the philosophy of the owners. The, the main thing is we don't like being bored. We always, <laughs> that's, stuff. We that's always that's like big up. stuff. <laughs> yeah. You like getting into the government stuff. It is fun. We can argue a little bit that the government even goes down. I mean, sometimes the government's budget goes down and then you don't. Coal goes in, it's cyclical. Oil yep. is cyclical. You, but you could also argue that we are in so many industries right now that we could not go any further and we would be okay. I, I agree with that. We want to grow. We want to get bigger. We like doing it. The owner board, I, I, I don't want to even talk about how much money we spend in R&D trying to improve, perfect, grow. We just really enjoy getting into everything. And when you see a new project out there that you've never seen before for an industry that you've never even heard of, it is fascinating and it, it, it makes us want to do what we do every day instead of being in the same exact boat, doing the same exact thing forever. I, I, I would not want to be a part of that. And then I guess people that end up sort of staying with the team, you know, being, you know, long-term employees, they're people that sort of enjoy that environment as well. So it's sort of, sort of the people that aren't that want that sort of repetitive they they probably don't <laughs> it's probably not a great fit for them well and i was just looking at a excel sheet that had uh years of service for a lot of our employees three one is at 37 one's at 34 33 and there are a lot of employees in the in the 20 year realm so i think that justifies it itself saying our employees like working here they like being doing something else if you're the kind of employee that just wants to get by and be on a conveyor line system and does the exact same thing, which I would lose my mind about, but if you're that kind of employee, l &H <laughs> is not the company for you. When we get high run projects, it, it's no more than like a hundred. We won't do, we will do a thousand, but you're swapping guys out because it's just miserable doing the same thing in and out. Mm. Patrick, what, what is your thoughts on that? It's, it's an interesting topic because a, a lot of companies are trying to do the exact opposite of that. 
I think the innovation for LNH has always been driven by the owner's group, very similar to what Gage said. But I, I think the way we go about it is, is probably more or less about the, the dollars. We look at industries and say, number one, are we a good fit for that? And then number two, can we add value? If we can add value and it fits us well, that's usually where what drives us into these other industries. It's not, um, we don't go in there just guessing if we can do something. We have a pretty good idea that we, right. we got a solid offering before we step into other industries, before we go down that road. What I, what I like to talk about is for a long time, we were an oil supplier. For a long time, we were a coal mining operation supplier. Once we made that transition into, we are a manufacturing facility with a lot of engineers, with a lot of space, with a lot of machines, it changed the game. You are not just one supplier anymore. You are one company does a lot of stuff. And it's, yeah, I, I can just imagine, like you said about talking about that R and D investment, I can just, oh, I can just imagine what that was just, and is, um, it would be insane. Um, but I wanted to do before, you know, sort of run out of time thing. I want to, uh, I want to talk about an actual couple specific projects. We've talked a little bit about crushers and I want to make sure that we're touching on, um, on the case studies as well, because there, there's a couple that I wanted to highlight. There's a, a tramp release case study, and then there's a gyrating uh, rebuild one. And I wanted to touch on both of those. Um, Patrick, I, I think I'd like to walk through, start with you, and then please, you know, go back and forth. Um, but we'll start, can we start with that tramp release system? Um, I've got it up there in front of me. It's quite, there's quite a bit of information on it, but if you could just sort of walk us through a, a summary of it. Yeah, they, they're designed for, um, upgrading older, the older Simon style crushers came with spring loaded, um, tensioners and it designed. So if you have a large object going to your crusher, that's an, what they call an uncrushable, it basically, the springs will, it'll overcome those springs, letting the, the top end of the crusher pick up and the tramp system drop or the tramp drop through problem with those systems. If this, if it does not drop through those, the tramp would get stuck between your head, but basically between your mantle and your your liner and your bowl and to get that out of there it's under literally hundreds of thousands of pounds of pressure and people would have to go in number one you got to dig your crusher out to get to the tramp and then they would go in and they would try to lance that material out of there while it was under thousands of pounds of pressure and what it was you were basically lancing on a bullet sometimes a 10 pound bullet and a lot of people have, over the years got hurt and or unfortunately killed trying to do this. So years ago, they came up with a, a system for changing those springs to hydraulics. Um, within mind that once you put the hydraulic system on there, if you have a tramp event, it'll overcome the hydraulics and pass through. If it does not pass through, there's four other cylinders on there that you can, what they call clearing a crusher. You can push it and it will pick the entire top end of your crusher up, allowing the tramp to fall through and all the material and what have you. So you're not spending, you know, two shifts digging it out, trying to clear that tramp out of there. So much safer uh, that really it was driven by safety, but it, once again, like I talked earlier, it, it's, it's safety first thing, but it's really drove the production rates up because guys weren't losing entire shifts, trying to clean, trying to clear a crusher. I'm going to, I'm going to pull it back to digital for just one second too. So with our digital power unit system, which is the, the, motor and horsepower and the pump for the tramp relief system we were able to digitally control that system so with your tramp relief you get about six to eight inches of lift so it lets a six to eight inch piece fall through with the digital system we are able to turn out a set amount so two inches it'll back that whole thing out two inches you then lift it up six or eight so now you're at 10 inches. So any piece of material is going to fall out. Then you can immediately turn that back in two inches to the exact same spot you were at and you can start crushing again. So it took a uh, eight hour, uh, some six to eight hour tramp event issue where you had to undig the entire thing, cut springs, do all this stuff into a 10 minute ordeal wow. to get this thing lifted up. Does the client know, does the client know what they want in, in this case, or are they saying, Hey, we have a problem, fix it. 
most of them understand what they're most of them, at least for that are going for tramp relief systems. Um, they generally do that because of safety issues because everyone obviously wants their people to be safer, but the production side is just a, a wonderful bolt on for them because it saves them, you know, tens of sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, not having these events that shut them down for days at a time during the year. Um, on the, on the gyrating side, is this, was this an example of, of a piece of equipment that was legacy sort of on its way out and now you're reviving it or is this a, was it a replacement thing? What, what was that project? It's an extreme legacy thing. That particular gyratory, um, much, much older model. In fact, there is now only three of them running in the world, wow. but it's such a large crusher to say, I'm just going to change that out. You're going to be down for weeks, if not months. Um, the crusher itself would cost you, you know, several millions of dollars to, to pull that endeavor off and change that crusher out. So really it came down to, can you fix it? Um, and they came to us for that. And we, we were able to step in and do some things and, and improve some things and repair some things and, our guys did all the, the design and, and build in the facilities. And then our guys out in the field did the installation and got them back up and running. So when you, you're machining new parts and all that sort of thing, I would assume on a project like that. Yes. Many times we are design machining because some of these older legacy machines have been modified so many times over the years that you can't. It's, you can't assume that it's going to be exactly what you think it's supposed to be until you get in there and, and do some engineering and figure out. And you may find out in the course of that engineering, as we did in this case, there's certain things that probably should have been changed anyways from a design aspect. So we were able to go in and make those those changes and innovations and then uh, reassemble and commission that and get it back up and running. And then do you put, now, uh, one thing I was asked, you, you said about an acquisition that had, uh, and this, either one of you could, can answer this, um, that an acquisition that had 200 clients already. And I was curious about the the repeat business. So this, like a gyratory uh, crusher unit, are you then, is a year later, are you coming back to service that unit? What is sort of the ongoing thing? If you do an acquisition with 200 clients, how many of those are annual or every 10 years? It, I mean, it's big equipment that needs to be serviced, but also there are other operations. I have other things are wearing out as well on other equipment. So I was just curious about, let's say there's four or 500 clients. How many of those are an annual thing? I, I can speak to that in this, in this case, uh, that particular client they come back to us it's almost every other day um because there's so many of them and it's spread across the entire united states so and because it's we are the oem on that product now right and i literally have them call me i've gone out in the field and looked at power units that were built in 2005 and they're still running these wow um, with minimal problems so it, it's a good product um Obviously, everything wears out over time, but they were designed in a way that uh, fairly simple to to troubleshoot and you know quick fix, if you will. If you need to get a guy out on the ground, you can. Some of it's designed in a way so that if you got guys on your team that are mechanically sound, most problems we can talk them through over the phone because a lot of times it's just change a valve, you know, change a coil, something fairly simple to work through. Right. Is so, and that would be, so that'd be most of your clientele then these are people that it, it's a continuous, um, on the aggregate side, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, a, right. it's actually become a, a fairly large piece of our Tempe facilities business. It probably accounts for 20% of their, their businesses, repeat clients coming in, particularly from the aggregate side. Well, uh, it definitely, it, de it, sorry, it definitely depends on who the customer is, if it's, it's the, if it's the big aggregate conglomerates that have bought up all these small mom and pops, and yes, we're talking yeah. to them daily for sure. If right. it is a mom and pop, we're still going to, you know, give them, sell them components, help them out, do everything. Um, but they just don't need as much. They have three facilities where a large conglomerate has 10,000, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, is that, so on the monitoring side, is that part of sort of an ongoing as they're expanding, especially I, I would guess you just said like a, a company that's buying up all these aggregate operations. 
I would guess then they're wanting to update the safety, the monitoring systems. That's sort of a continuous thing just on that side. Well, monitoring is so new to LNH. Yes, we've been doing it on the background for a year and a half, two years, uh, really hard for eight months. But this month will strike the first uh, LNH announcement. And actually, you're hearing about it first. So oh, this, this, this strikes the, the conversation into, hey, we're there. We are ready and we do have a system. Well, it's exciting. It's, well, that's the fun of us doing these shows. We get to hear about this sort of some of this stuff. Uh, and because we pre-record them, sometimes we get to hear it before it even uh, gets actually released. Um, just to, to wrap up, I wanted to ask about your, uh, there, there's two questions. Um, I think Patrick, I'll start with you on the first and then Gage on the second part. Patrick, on your, on the, the first part is, um, the distribution model, are you, is it all direct or are you working with partners, um, filterings in some of these clients needs and are, do you have partners or is it all direct? Um, to we have update. partners throughout the globe. We use several, um, you know, we have partners in South America. We have partners in Europe. So we, we have multiple partners that really allow us to do anything from offering better materials, better metallurgy to offering entire aggregate plants. I mean, that's the range of our partners in around the globe. We literally could come in and we have bid on several complete plant installations. Um, that, that's the flexibility we have because of the, we, we do a great job of monitoring and or qualifying our suppliers um, before, we, before we start doing a lot of business with them. We wanna make sure that it's a good match from a culture standpoint. It's a good match from a quality standpoint. Um, so most of the companies that we do business at that level are built very similar to us, have a very similar DNA as far as their quality and safety and those items. But just might not have that, sca that really scaled up sort of specialty uh, production skill. Yeah, well, they, they build good equipment. Uh, you know, they build great equipment. They, they, they make, you know, great castings, whatever that particular supplier is, but they don't have a footprint like we have or the facilities or the field teams to be able to go out and service it after the sell. And that's really our strength is once we, we get the, that stuff out into the marketplace, we have an incredible team that, that supports it. So, uh, And then Gage, the second part that I wanted to wrap up with is the, the expectation when people come to you. And I think this is an important thing um, in any interview that we do like this. And I've tried to do more of it is um, when, if someone is watching this and they're saying, okay, yeah, I've got this operation, let's say U S and Canada, um, and, and you're a good fit for that. What should they expect from that sort of that day one commissioning of the project? Um, you know, what kind of communication, what, what is, what, how do you, how do you approach that expectation that clients should have when they're, they're starting that, that new relationship with you? Well, I think that's why we've maintained so many customers and so much business over the past 60 years next year is because start to finish 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, we are always there. We are always a phone call away and we respond very quickly. So RFQs, bids, um, if you're looking for something in particular, if you want our engineers to come look at a special product, we are always there. We are always available and we grow our team to accommodate for all of our customers. So you're going to experience better communication using LNH. You are going to experience fair pricing you are going to experience innovation and you're going to be able to suggest, can we do this a little different? Can we do this? We are not stuck in one way where right. one customer, one component fits all customers. We, we don't believe that. We see some components do that, but largely amount of time, if you are operating in Canada, it's colder. You're going to need something harder. If you're operating in, in, uh, Arizona, it's hotter. You don't need some, some things. So it's, it, it's definitely uh, component based or utility based or anything like that, but we are your one-stop shop that can help and assist you in any of your problems or any of your needs, not even problems. Uh, and I, I can't help but ask this question. Uh, the supply chain issues come up on the, on all of our series that we produce. I think it's coming up. 
Um, has that been an advantage to you? I mean, I'm, I'm sure like everybody, there's a piece of steel that's that's hard to get sometimes and things like that. But in general, has that really, uh, has that been an advantage to L&H because people need these projects? You're actually there with these manufacturing, sort of localized manufacturing facilities? We have very good product line managers that determine the need. When COVID started becoming a thing and supply chain started becoming a, a huge issue, luckily we were able to get through the first year and a half, no hiccups. Uh, then, so that had been a year and a half ago, we saw a little bit of hiccups on a few jobs. So a little bit of delays, but nothing compared to what the uh, OEMs or uh, the large suppliers they, were experiencing. They told me stories off camera that are just staggering like staggering stories i mean obviously well, go and repeat them on the show but yeah is, but and happen. it's and and it's still not fixed so no, we no, not our our lead time is still pretty low it definitely depends on the opponent but we usually win on lead time we are the fastest that i've seen we have a huge amount of inventory for our specific components that the product line managers think we do need so i think in that aspect yes it did affect us a little bit but definitely not as much as other people and i think uh our customers saw that as a better better start using these guys more because they have it figured out yeah no i bet Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, uh, you know, you, you're the, it's a, you're both your first time on the show, but thank you for coming back um, as a company and doing this. Um, it's it's exciting doing these shows. It's it's the first episode of a company is always a tough one if they're not coming back because you just don't get it, especially someone who does what L and H does. You just can't dig in properly. So th it was nice to sort of round out the edges um, from the first episode. So thank you both. And uh, hopefully we'll get you back on again. Yep. I appreciate you getting our word out there and telling people about our business. That is uh, that is the conclusion of the Crownsman show for this episode. Uh, we'll have links. Um, I was taking some notes for, for our editors. Um, we're going to have links to things like the app um, that they have. Um, and, and some of these, these case studies will also have links to, so you can go and check them out in more detail. There's plenty to see there. Lots of information on the Island H website. Thank you for watching, everybody. We will see you on the next episode of The Crowdfund Show.